Hello everyone, my name is Emily Oldrich and I am the museum educator at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center in Portsmouth, Ohio. Thank you all for joining us today at the Friends of Serpent Mound Summer Solstice Celebration. Uh, so um, I want to take a moment to thank the museum sponsors that made it possible for me to be here today. So I'd like to thank the Ohio Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the City of Portsmouth, the Scioto Foundation, the Richard D. Martin Foundation, and the Southern Ohio Medical Center. So we're going to be taking a trip back in time today and talking about the ancient people that lived here in Ohio uh, several thousand years before we did. So today we're going to be talking about the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex, artifacts found there, and what these artifacts tell us, which these artifacts reveal that during these prehistoric times there was a trade network that spanned the entire North American continent. And we're going to look at some of these artifacts and talk a little bit about where they came from and what the people did with them and how they obtain their materials. Uh, I'd like to give some thank yous. You'll see some lovely photographs today, so I have to thank Lacey Davis, who is a professional photographer that was generous enough to donate her time creating these lovely images. And then I also have to thank Dr. Kurt Shoemaker, who is a professor of geology at Shawnee State University. So he helped us last summer while we were closed down for the pandemic, identify the materials that you'll see in these artifacts and also the sources of these materials within the country. So I'm going to give you a little background on the collection. So the Southern Ohio Museum is actually a fine art museum. So if you come to the Southern Ohio Museum, we have about five different temporary rotating exhibits every year of artwork, paintings, sculptures, and things like that. Uh, but we also have a permanent collection of over 10,000 prehistoric Native American artifacts, which is always on display. So this is our Art of the Ancients exhibit, and anytime you come to the museum, you can come and see it. It's always free to come to the museum. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 10 in the morning until 5 in the evening, and we're also open Saturdays from 1 to 5. Uh, so Locally, the Art of the Ancients exhibit, the artifacts in that ex exhibition are known as the Wurtz Collection. And the reason for this is because the entire collection of over 10,000 artifacts was brought together by a father and son. So Charles Wurtz was the dad. He was alive in the late 1800s when they first started excavating the mounds here in Ohio. So when the Ohio uh, Historical and Archaeological Society came down and excavated the mounds around Portsmouth, like the Tremper Mound and the Fort Mounds and Village, Charles Wurtz was on site for these exhibitions and assisted with them. Uh, so in the exhibition, we've got artifacts that date back to the Paleo-Indian period, so we're talking about the end of the Ice Age, and then probably the newest artifacts in the collection are maybe 500 years old, belonging to the late prehistoric period for ancient culture. Uh, but the large body of the collection comes from the people that built the mounds, and uh, these are the mounds like you see at Portsmouth, and also the mound that is right next door to us, the Great Serpent Mound. Uh, so the museum um, was gifted this collection by Madeline A. Wirtz, Bill Wirtz's widow, and um, the museum got the collection in the early 2000s, and then in 2016, um, Madeline passed away in 2014. In 2016, the Salvation Army got the contents of Madeline's house donated to them, and they found a small metal box, and within this box was the Charles Wirtz catalog. So now, out of the 10,000 some artifacts that are in the collection, we know where about 1,000 of them came from. And so this is a picture of Ms. Huxall. She was working at the library in the 1940s. And in the 1920s, Charles Wirtz actually donated his portion of the collection to the city of Portsmouth. And the city of Portsmouth made an agreement with the Portsmouth Public Library that they were going to house the artifacts there so people could always come and see them for free. And while the artifacts were at the Portsmouth Public Library, Ms. Huxall had her master's degree in archaeology and took it upon herself to create the Charles Wirtz catalog. So she was the one that is responsible for uh, saving and preserving all of this information. Because Charles Wirtz took the artifacts to the library, he installed them in locked cases, he had labels that went with them, and she was able to follow all of his labeling and information to make this catalog. And so this is a photograph of her numbering pieces in the collection. Uh, so I do want to make it very clear that there are no human remains in the Wurtz collection at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center. Any human remains that were in the collection were repatriated before the museum took possession. 
So I've been doing research. I've been at the museum now for about eight years. I started in 2014, and I've been lucky enough to be able to do a lot of research on the collections. So my main job is teaching art classes and giving tours to people. So I wanted to learn about this material so that I could tell people about it. And when I started this job, I knew very little about prehistoric artifacts. But in the meantime, I've discovered that the Portsmouth Earthworks was actually at one point in time the largest earthen mound complex in the entire world. Now, most of this mound complex is no longer in existence. Uh, the city was developed over the top of it, uh, but there are a small amount of mounds that are still here, and I was able to create a new map based off of old historic maps of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. So if you look at the picture here, if I can get my pointer to work. Uh, the middle here is downtown Portsmouth, centered right at Mound Park. So one of the very few remaining mounds that we have left in Portsmouth is the Horseshoe Mound at Mound Park, and it is open to the public, and we're probably going to be talking about Mound Park here shortly. But to give you a little context about where we're at, the map on the left here shows you the distance from Portsmouth down here to Serpent Mound, where we are now. And so that's about 30... 32 miles on the map. I also want to show you here on the right side, this is some context for Portsmouth and the distance to Mound City and Chillicothe. So Mound City and Chillicothe is probably one of the more well-known Hopewell Mound complexes in the state of Ohio. And as you see um, here shortly, there is a tight relationship between Mound City and the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. So we're going to talk a little bit now about sites within the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. So this is one of the earliest maps of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex, and this comes from Squire and Davis's ancient monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And you can see that at that point in time, Portsmouth was a lot smaller. Here we've got the Ohio River, and then coming down from the north is the Great Scioto River. Uh, and then we've got two horseshoe mounds there in the middle. One of those, the eastern one, is still at Mound Park. And then there were radiating parallel lines of mounds that ran for many miles in all four intermediate directions. And this is actually the only prehistoric earthwork complex in the whole world that has parallel lines of embankments leading from one earthwork toward a river that pick up again on the other side and lead to another earthwork. And this actually spans Portsmouth into Kentucky. So part of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex is not in Ohio, it's actually in Kentucky. Uh, and the estimation in the 1800s was that there's over 21 and a half miles of mounds in the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. So the center of this complex, kind of the hub of the wheel, is Mound Park. And here on the left, we have an aerial drone photograph of the Horseshoe Mound. Uh, and the Horseshoe Mound is about 140 feet long, or 150 feet long and about 140 feet wide. And then here's the ground level view. The fence that surrounds the Horseshoe Mound is about three feet high. So you can see that the mound itself is anywhere from about eight to 12 feet above the, uh, above the ground. And then there's also a plateau in the middle of the Horseshoe, which is at least three or four feet high. So this is a close-up, also from Squire and Davis, of Group B. So you can see the twin horseshoe mounds in the middle, surrounded by an embankment. And then we've got parallel embankments leading off in all four intermediate directions. So in the Words Collection at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center, we do have artifacts that were discovered in Mound Park. So we don't know where in Mound Park, there's no context whether they were found within the mound or wherever they were at in the park, but they were attributed in the Charles Wirtz catalog to Mound Park. On the left, we've got a horned banner stone made of green stone. Uh, so banner stones are something archaeologists still argue about the purpose. They're not quite sure what they're for. A lot of archaeologists think that these were atolatl weights. So we're talking about... 2,000 years ago, they didn't yet have bow and arrow technology. They had what they called an atolatl or a spear thrower, which was a short stick that had a hook on it that they'd use to throw their spear farther and more powerfully and more accurately. Uh, and so some archaeologists think that's what the banner stones are for. Banner stones are named like they were used at the top of a staff as a banner to signify that so it was an important member of the group. And they actually found in the Carolinas banner stones that had two foot long stone handles that fitted into them. So I think that that's probably a pretty good conclusion of the purpose of at least some of these. Uh, greenstone is not a native stone to Scioto County. Greenstone could be sourced um, from Canada. 
and also from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, a lot of people think that it probably came down through the action of the glaciers. So greenstone is a hard stone. It could have been transported from the Canadian Shield through the glaciers and then left not in Scioto County because glaciers never made it to Scioto County, but they could have traveled up near Ross County or into northern Ohio to be able to obtain this material. So it was sourced outside of Scioto County most likely. Now it could have been carried down into the stream beds of the Scioto River or one of its tributaries along the way. On the right hand side, we have a two-hold biconvex biconcave gorget. And there's also a lot of argument about what these might have been. Um, when the early Spanish explorers came to the Americas in the 1500s, they brought back illustrations of people that were similar ornaments and shell around their necks, like a necklace. Uh, they had found them associated with burials close to the neck, and so they're actually named for the medieval piece of armor called the gorget, which is shielding the neck. Uh, but that's not to say that that's how they were all used. Uh, but this one, particular one is made out of slate, and slate is also a material that is not native to Scioto County. So our closest source of slate is the Blue Ridge Mountains, so we're looking at North and South Carolina for sourcing this material. Now it is possible that slate could have been brought down through the glaciers, and there's a lot of archaeologists that contend that this is the way that it was brought here, uh, but the geologists, especially Dr. Shoemaker, stressed that slate is such a fragile material that the process of the glacier carrying it down from Canada would probably break it up into pieces so small that you wouldn't be able to make an ornament out of it. So, and he he also said that the slate quality that you get in the Blue Ridge Mountains is much higher quality slate than what you get up north, and he thinks that they probably traveled or traded to obtain this material from the Carolinas. Uh, we also have pottery that came from Mound Park. So the earthwork complex that we just looked at centered at Mound Park is thought to have been built about 2,000 years ago. The pottery that you see here is thought to date to about 1,000 years ago or later in the late prehistoric period. And the reason why the archaeologists think this is because of what's called temper. So when you make a vessel out of clay, if you just use clay and you fire it, it's going to expand and shrink during that process and it's going to crack. So if you're making something like this, you have to add what's called temper to keep it from shrinking and expanding so much. And you can use different materials for this. So the older pottery, they use stone or grit or grog, which is already fired pottery in order to temper their clay. And then archaeologists think that maybe about 8,900 people started using burnt shell in order to temper their ceramics. And so usually if you find any ceramics with bits of shell in them, those are from the late prehistoric period. But the interesting thing about these vessels is that even though they might not have belonged to the Hopo culture, these are vessels that are southern in style. So these are kind of vessels that you would see in Arkansas, you could see these in Missouri, you see these in Alabama, Tennessee, western Kentucky. So these are not typical vessels that you would see in southern Ohio. Uh, so archaeologists suggest that maybe these were traded for or influenced by contact with other prehistoric people. And then also from Mound Park, we have something that is thought to date older than the mounds. So this is a socketed copper spear point, which dates back to the Archaic period. So we're talking about 8,000 BC uh, to maybe 5,000 BC is when these tools were thought to have been made. And uh, you can see the top of the object here and then the bottom here. So when this object came to the museum, there was a handful of items that were thought to be too young to fit with the rest of the display. So these items were kept in storage. And while I was researching this collection, this was one of the items that was in that box. So this was thought to have dated to the European contact period. They thought this was forged metal because there's some lines down the bottom of it. But with further research, this is actually sheet copper. So people during the woodland period, 2,000 years ago, and the archaic period, 8,000 years ago, did not smelt metal, the archaeologist thinks. They didn't heat the metal up to the point where it would melt, but they would maybe heat it up a little bit and hammer it into sheets and then form it into objects like this. So when I found this object, it was in collection storage in a box with other items that are thought to be too new or from places that didn't fit in with the collection. Uh, but luckily I was able to discover that it fit with the collection quite nicely, so it's now back on display with the rest of the Art of the Ancients exhibition. So you can see here we've got a Cherokee pipe, 
uh, some other pipes that are probably in the early historic period. Uh, there is actually an obsidian point in the middle, but if you look on the back of it, there's a sticker that says uh, Santa Clara County, California. So that's why that piece was not added into the exhibition. Now, after we got the Charles Wirtz catalog, there are pieces in the exhibition that are from outside of the area. We've got some pottery that's from Mexico, we've got arrow uh, spear points that are from Tennessee and Georgia, uh, some pottery from Arkansas, so maybe our obsidian point wouldn't fit in so bad these days. The majority of the collection is local. So there's some other mounds that are associated with Portsmouth Group B, which are the Horseshoe Mounds. So here is a map that was made in the late 1800s by the city engineer, and you can see the two Horseshoe Mounds. There's the one in Mound Park, and then there was another Horseshoe Mound there at the bottom, and then if we look to the east, there's a mound here on the Lawson property, and this is the Lawson Mound. And from the Lawson Mound, we've got a very interesting object uh, that is a rare find. So this one is described in the Charles Wirtz catalog as a stone hammer. And you can see it does have a flattened pole where you could use it as a hammer. And then it has another side that looks like it maybe it could be an axe. Uh, it's also been suggested that it's possibly a banner stone. But no matter what it's made out of, <laughs> it's a hard stone that is foreign to Scioto County. So this is another stone, diabase, which comes from Canada. And then here from the Lawson Mound, we have another object of banded slate thought to belong to, or thought to have originated in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, this piece is probably ceremonial. It looks like what you might think is an ax or a pick or a tomahawk, uh, but it's made out of slate. Slate is such a fragile material that if you hit something with it, it's gonna break. So that's why the archeologists think that it's ceremonial. And then from the Lawson Mound, we have copper, which comes in forms that are linked to the Hopewell culture. So these are probably the people that first built the mounds of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. On the left, we have a copper breastplate. It has two holes in it. They have found these large copper plates uh, with twined string attached to pearls through the holes to hold them, um, probably wrapped around a person's neck and then hanging down around their chest. And then uh, the item on the right here in the Charles Wirtz catalog had two listings for both pieces and they were listed as a headdress, a crescent headdress. So we assume that was probably how it was found. And then uh, one of the better known mounds of the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex is the Heinisch Mound. So going from Portsmouth Group B to the southwest following the parallel embankments leads you right by what was once the Heinisch Mound. The Heinisch Mound is no longer there. The Lawson Mound is no longer there. Uh, but at one time the Heinisch Mound was a pretty large mound. You can see this gentleman standing on top of it there. So from the Heinisch Mound, uh, we have a granite adze. An adze is different from an axe or a cell is what they call them when they don't have a groove in them. Uh, an adze has one side that's flat. And so you can see here on the right, this side's flat and the other side is curved. And this helped to attach it to a handle. So if you had a handle, it'd kind of be attached like this to where you could kind of dig out a, a canoe, hollow out a log, shape wood with it. It's like this V-shape. Yeah. <coughs> And we have some pottery from Heinisch Mound. This is also late prehistoric period pottery, they think, because it is shell-tempered. And this is a style that's also found in places like Missouri and Arkansas. You can see that the handles have a hole drilled on both sides for suspension, and then they have like a scalloped decoration along the edge. I'm going to take a drink of water here. And then we have some more pottery from the Heinisch Mountain. Uh, this pottery is grit tempered, which normally if you're in Ohio, you would think that this pottery is going to belong to the woodland period or maybe the late archaic period. But this pottery is a lot different from what you see in the region. And it's even a lot different than what you see in the southern woodlands, like what we've looked at, because this pottery actually comes from the Mongolian culture in New Mexico. And so there has never before been documented a link between the Mogollon culture in New Mexico and the Hopewell or for ancient cultures in Southern Ohio. 
but we have multiple pieces of pottery in the Wirtz collection that are attributed to Portsmouth Earthworks Complex mound sites which belong to the Mogollon culture. So this brownware pottery, uh, it's kind of got an orange-brown clay body to it, it's tempered with grit or sand, and it's also what they call smudged. So during the firing process, it's been blackened on the inside, and you can see that there's some blackening along the outside of the rim also. Uh, this pottery dates back as early, they think, as maybe 150 BC. Um, some people place the beginning of the Mogollon culture at about AD 200 which would overlap with the Hopo culture. The Mogollon culture went on to exist through about AD 1450, and then they disappeared. No one knows what happened to them. So they overlap both the Hopo culture in the Woodland period, and then also the Fort Ancient culture in the late prehistoric period. So here's a map. Uh, this is kind of the tip of Texas down here. This is the state of New Mexico, and then this is Arizona over here. So the region we're talking about is the Gila River here, which stretches into, from New Mexico into Arizona. And this is the area where the pottery that we're talking about was first discovered. <coughs> so if we move southwest, from Mound Park, across the Ohio River, we come to the Old Fort Earthwork. The Old Fort Earthwork, by itself, is the largest prehistoric earthwork in Kentucky. So it just goes to show you how impressive the mounds of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex really are. <coughs> Portions of the old Fort Earthwork were excavated in 1938 and 1939 by Charles Bohannon and the Works Progress Administration <coughs> Archaeology Program. So on the left here is a photograph taken in 1938 of a corner of the old Fort Earthwork. And the walls of the Old Fort Earthwork at the highest are about 25 feet high. And then at the lowest, uh, the parallel wings of the Old Fort Earthwork are about 3 feet high. And portions of this earthwork are still in existence on private property in South Portsmouth, Kentucky. It is not open to the public. So you can see we started out at Mound Park. We followed the southwest parallel embankments across the Ohio River to the Old Fort Earthwork. So in the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center Wirtz Collection, we have a single object attributed to the old Fort Earthwork, and it is a small granite cell. So the cell is the more modern version of the prehistoric axe, and this one is made of granite, which is another stone that's not native to Scioto County. Now there are other mounds besides the old Fort Earthwork which are associated with what they call Portsmouth Group A, and we have some pottery. We don't know what mounds these are attributed to, but we do know that they come from Portsmouth Group A. And so on the left here, we have a bowl that we see a style kind of similar in Kentucky. So this one's a more local style. It's shell-tempered, so we assume it's from the late prehistoric period. On the right, we have another Mogollon culture bowl. And this one is really spectacular. Uh, this is what they call corrugated, so you can see where somebody started making this vessel with very tiny little coils, and we're very careful in the decoration. The inside of it's completely smooth, the outside of it has this amazing texture, and then it's also decor decorated with little indentations and geometric patterns. So it's very recognizable as Mogollon culture pottery. So, let's see, we're headed to Portsmouth Group D. So if we take the southeast parallel embankments, to the Ohio River and cross on the other side, it takes us to Portsmouth Group C, which we'll talk about in a moment. To the west of Portsmouth Group C is Portsmouth Group D, which is the Biggs Mound, which was a conical mound with an embankment. Uh, on the left is a photograph taken in 1938 during the Works Progress Administration excavation, and on the right is an illustration from Squire and Davis's Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, so you can see how much uh, damage 
plowing did to the mound over the span of years. This was drawn in about 1848. This is 100 years later. Uh, how much damage was done just by the activity of plowing and cultivating the fields. The Biggs Mound is actually still in existence. It's on the private property of Mark West Hydrocarbon Incorporated in South Shore, Kentucky. And uh, we are hoping that someday it might again be open to the public. So Portsmouth Group C is what they call the Temple Mound. This is huge. We're talking about over 1,500 feet across the whole thing. Uh, it's got a conical mound in the center with a ditch. And then there's three rings that come around the outside of it. And it also has those embankments which lead to the river. So to the west of Portsmouth Group D and Portsmouth Group C is the Jim King Mound. So this mound hasn't before been recognized as part of the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex. This mound was excavated by the Works Progress Administration. So you can see these photographs from the 1930s when they were excavating the mound. But prior to that, it was also excavated by Charles Wirtz, who was one of those two collectors of the collection we're talking about. And he reported finding amazing things in this mound. So they found sheets of mica in the top of the mound. Mica is another mineral uh, that's found in the Carolinas that is not from Scioto County. Uh, he also reported finding a burial of a female, which has not been recorded very often, and they called her the Great Ancient Princess of Kentucky. They found a copper headdress associated with her in the shape of a swan with wings outspread, so this was a really special place. Uh, so if we look at the map here, <laughs> the embankments, we think, didn't quite look like they did on Squire and Davis's map, because we have aerial photographs of these embankments, and that's where they end up. And they're supposed to be across the river from each other, so we assume that's here. So if we're looking at Group C, and we go west, we've got the Biggs Mound, and then we've got the Jim King Mound there to the west of that in South Shore. From the Jim King Mound, we also have some non-local material. We've got another salt made of diabase, which we think probably came down from Canada, maybe with the glaciers. We've got multiple gorgets. So the gorgets have two or more holes. If there's three holes, it's still a gorget. If it's one hole, we call it a pendant. And these are all made of slate. So we've got some banded slate, we've got some gray slate, and then we also have some black slate at the bottom. So these are all materials that we think were sourced in the Blue Ridge Mountains. We also have bone and shell beads. Uh, the bone is probably local. This outer necklace is from the Jim King Mound. That is probably local animals, deer. Uh, but if we look at these shells, the shell necklace, some of those shells appear to be marine shells. And so there's not a notion anywhere close to Portsmouth, Ohio. So you'd have to go to the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of these marine shells were warm water shells. So we're talking about traveling down to the Gulf of Mexico to obtain some of these materials. And from the Jim King Mound, we have copper. Uh, so we've got copper bracelets, a copper ring, we've got a copper ornament here, and another partial piece of copper bracelets. I don't think I mentioned before the sourcing of the copper. So copper, they've done studies, and they think there was two different places where they got copper. One place was surrounding Lake Superior, so they have lots of prehistoric mines surrounding Lake Superior where they had copper, but then the other source of copper was in the southern Appalachian Mountains. So it's the same place where they'd go and source their banded slate and slate objects. They would also source mica and they would source copper. So Tremper Mound is probably one of the more well-known mounds associated with the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex, even though it's considered by a lot of archaeologists to be an outlier, which makes no sense because it is part of the largest prehistoric earth and mound complex in the whole world, and it's actually closer to Portsmouth Group B than some of the other recognized elements of the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex. So the Tremper Mound, this is a... Uh, print from the ancient monuments of the Mississippi Valley. This was surveyed in 1846 and you can see that it was originally thought to be an effigy mound. Now when they excavated this mound in 1915 they found a series of post holes underneath it which kind of roughly matched the shape of the outline so some people argue that it is not an effigy mound. 
Uh, but there's really no reason why it couldn't both be an effigy mound and also uh, match the what was underneath it, the structure. The structure that was underneath it is also special. It's what they refer to as a charnel house. So this is a special building where they used to process the dead. So they found uh, the cremated remains of, they estimate anywhere between 350 and 400 individuals buried within caches in the Trumper Mound, and then they also found um, some actual uh, full body burials in the Trumper Mound as well. So if we're looking at the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex, we've got Group B down here. We were just looking at Group C. We were looking at Group A. Tremper is up here. So you can see one of the parallel embankments of the earthworks leads to the northwest. And to the northwest is also the Tremper Mound. Uh, the Tremper Mound has some other earthworks associated with it, which we're not going to get into so much today. But there's a grouping of earthworks here at the Tremper Mound. So here's a little bit closer view of it. So we've got the Tremper Mound here. Uh, we are, they're also reported to be a square and an oval enclosure. And then right across the Scioto River from the Tremper Mound is the Fort Mounds and Village, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then at the top of this hill is a very convenient source of pipestone in the Fort Pipestone Quarry. So within the Tremper Mound, this is not in the Southern Ohio Museum collection. This is, these are objects that are in the collection of the Ohio History Connection. And there was found, among other artifacts, a cache of 60 effigy pipes. So effigy is a fancy word for something in the shape of a person or an animal. So these were all pipes, platform pipes, carved in the shape of local wildlife. And so you can see some of the examples here. We've got things like heron eating a fish. We've got squirrels, bobcats, bears, uh, dogs, wolves, turtles, otters, all kinds of different species of birds. So an amazing assortment, so well made that, and so naturalistically carved that the archaeologists think they can determine exact species of these animals. Now here's the interesting part. We talked a little bit earlier about that connection between Portsmouth and Mound City. So the only other place in the whole world where they found anything like this is Mound City. So these pipes were unearthed in 1915 at Tremper Mound. In 1846, they found a cache of very similar effigy pipes at the Pipe Mound in Mound City. And these pipes are carved in a manner that is so similar to Tremper Mound that some archaeologists argue that they were made by the same person. Uh, and now they've done pipestone studies uh, back in 2015 and analyzed the pipestone in these different pipestone caches. And what's interesting is most of these pipes from Mound City in Chillicothe, Ohio, are thought to have been crafted from pipestone at the Fort Mounds of Village in Portsmouth. Uh, now, if we go back and look at the Tremper Mound pipes, there were very few items from the Tremper Mound that were carved out of pipestone from the Fort Mounds and Village. There were two tube pipes that they think were carved out of that pipestone. There were some ear spools carved out of that pipestone. But these pipes are thought to have been carved out of pipestone that was sourced in Illinois. So there's something about exotic materials that was really attractive to these people. So in Chillicothe, the Fort Pipestone Quarry, I guess, was far enough away <laughs> that it was worthwhile. But at Tremper Mound, it was uh, much more valuable to have pipestone that was from out of state. Uh, and then, okay, so these, I think these pipes are actually no longer on display at the Ohio History Connection. They were at one point in time. Uh, they are now considered burial goods, so they are not on display anymore. The pipes from Mound City, <laughs> when they were found, they actually, um, it, uh, Davis tried to sell them to anyone in Ohio that wanted them. No one in Ohio was interested in them. You got to think back, this is at the time when the U.S. government was still waging war with Native Americans across the western frontier. So there was a little animosity there. People weren't so much interested in Native American culture. Uh, so not only he asked everyone in the state of Ohio if they wanted them, no one wanted them. He asked everyone in the whole country if they wanted them. No one in America was interested in these pipes. They are sold to the British Museum. Museum. They are now in London. You can go to the British Museum and look at them. 
I did uh, talk to uh, some representatives at Mountain City a few years ago, and they did say that um, the British Museum was amenable to repatriating them and keeping them at Mountain City if they got to the point where they had proper facilities to house them. So that would be a really exciting thing for us to be able to actually see those back in Ohio. Uh, so in the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center Wirtz collection, we have some objects from the Tremper Mound. Uh, and then there's also a village to the south of Tremper Mound, so we have a few items from the Tremper Village. So from the Tremper Mound, we have a fully grooved axe. This type of axe is the older prehistoric axe, and these are thought to date to the archaic period before the time the mounds were built. And we have two more of these archaic period grooved axes in the Wirtz collection. Uh, siltstone and sandstone are actually native, so these two axes would have probably been sourced locally, but the one that we just looked at, granite here, uh, the, somebody got really lucky, granite could have been brought down in the streams from the glaciers. And then also from the Tremper Mound, we have a very interesting artifact, uh, which nobody really knows exactly what it is, whether it's an effigy or a tool. Uh, there's really no other artifacts that look exactly like this one. Uh, this one's made out of a banded schist. Dr. Shoemaker said if you look at it with the lens, it has little pieces of garnet in it, so it's a very fancy rock that it's made out of and a very hard stone, so it could have been used as a tool, but it's certainly not uh, native to Scioto County. And then here we have a huge banner stone from the Tremper Mound, and this is made of slate, which was probably sourced in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And then here we have a platform pipe uh, made of pipestone. We don't know the source of the pipestone. Part of the problem with determining or attempting to determine the source of the pipestone is that part of the artifact has to be destroyed in order to run those tests on it. And so most museums we're in the business of preserving objects and looking at how those objects speak to us and to humanity and so we don't want to destroy the object in order to learn more about it we're kind of into preserving it instead uh, so from the Tremper Mound, we have some copper. So we've got a copper axe there on the left, and then two copper ear spools on the right. Both of these are consistent with Hopewell culture artifacts. So the Fort Mounds and Village to the east of the Tremper Mound is a multi-component site. In the past, it's mostly been recognized as belonging to the late prehistoric period and the Fort Ancient culture. <clears throat> but in the Wurtz collection, we have objects that date all the way back to the Archaic period and also objects that link to the Woodland period and the Hopewell culture. All right, so we started out down here at the Horseshoe Mounds, and if we go straight north, we get to the Fort Mounds and Village. And so there's hills in here. So if you wanted to get to the Fort Mounds and Village, probably the best pathway to take would be the Northwest Parallel Embankments, which go past the hills. And then you could go straight up the bottom land to the Fort Mounds and Village. So in the Wurtz collection, we have some flint. So what was really cool is the catalog told us a lot about the objects that came in with the collection. But some of this stuff I had to figure out myself. Uh, so there are pictures. These pictures here are the pictures from Mill's report on the Fort Bounds of Village excavation. So the village was excavated in 1916. Uh, and then he published this book in 1917. So these are photographs from 1917. This piece is on display at the museum, and I was able to match the flake scarring from the photograph with the piece in the collection. So there are some pieces that I just figured out by looking at the photographs. Uh, and then this is also not native flint. So there are some very limited flint resources in Scioto County, uh, but not a, a ton. So the, great, the closest source of readily available flint to Scioto County and probably to Adams County too is Flint Ridge in eastern Ohio. Uh, but if we look at this flint, this doesn't appear to be Flint Ridge flint. This actually appears to be Indiana hornstone. So this would have been sourced in Indiana. And then here we've got a couple grooved axes. So we're looking back at the archaic period again, granite and diabase, both non-native stones. This is another couple pieces. Both of these axes were entered in the catalog, but they weren't designated as coming from the Fort Village site. They didn't have any provenance associated with them. So I was able to identify them from the photograph. And then we've got some pipestone pieces here, also pictured in Mill's book 
which is really nice in color because there's some really pretty pipes, but they didn't have color photography back when Mills was taking pictures. And then here on the right, we have a hematite platform pipe preform. So this is what the pipe would have looked like there on the right before it was finished. The hasn't been drilled in the bowl yet. There's no drilling in it, but you can see that they've roughed out uh, the platform pipe shape. And that is thought to date to the woodland period. And then we've got a couple more preforms here. These ones have drilling started, and it's really cool. If you drill with flint, it leaves these concentric rings in the stone, and you can see that very well in both of these pieces. Uh, the pipe on the left is pipestone. It could have come from the Fort Village. There is yellow pipes, or not the Fort Village, but the Fort Pipestone Quarry. Uh, there is yellow pipestone associated with the quarry. Uh, the one on the right is a hard stone, which is also not native to Scioto County. And then here we've got a coal spud. Coal's local. It probably was sourced nearby. But on the right, we have what they call a ceremonial pick. And this is in a banded slate, which once again was probably sourced at the Blue Ridge Mountains. And then we've got some slate pieces. And then at the top here is a greenstone chisel. So we're looking at also non-native materials and some objects that we're not quite sure what they are. <laughs> at the bottom here is maybe a tablet, but it looks like the way it's made, it's either in the process of being split in two or maybe they were wrapping twine around it. Who knows? Uh, this one is thought to maybe be an atlatl weight. It has a groove around it, so it could have been tied to an atlatl if you were throwing. And then we have some, uh, probably a ceremonial piece here. These are known um, a lot of times as lizard effigies. I don't think it looks much like a lizard. I'll leave it up to you what you think it is. But they find them kind of similar forms like this in banded slate. All of these objects are banded slate. Uh, on the right are what they call banner stones, um, that ball banner stone. Those could have been at a lot of wage. They don't really know. And then there's also what they think is a ceremonial knife made of slate. The reason why we think it's ceremonial is because there's no chips in it. It doesn't look like it's ever been used. And then this one was uh, what Bill Wirtz considered to be one of the most interesting pieces in his collection. It has one hole drilled all the way through it, sort of like a pendant, but it's very bulbous. It's not flat like a pendant. And then it's carved. It says May 11, 1747. So somebody had a hold of it very early in pioneer days and did some carving on the object uh, themselves. And if you can, I don't know if you can see, but there's also a face and profile carved into the rock over here. And then you can see there's a partially drilled hole on this side, but it's not drilled the whole way through. And then if we look at the other side of it, we've got a little arrowhead engraved into it over here. There's another face and profile with an eye and an ear here. And then there is a hafted stone axe down there by the catalog number. And then you can see there's two more partially drilled holes. And then there's one hole dr started here, but it doesn't go the whole way through the object. So somebody was experimenting with this one. Uh, and then we've got some more preforms. On the right there are two preforms of probably banner stones, and those are in hard stone, which is not native to Scioto County. On the left are as a concretion, maybe a hammer stone, and then also maybe a pipe or banner stone preform, both made out of a milky quartz. Uh, quartz is not native to Scioto County, but I was informed by Jeffrey Wilson that there is an outcropping of this white quartz at the cliff of Serpent Mound. So they may have even come here to source some of that material. And so we've got copper from Mill's report. You can see here the copper real gorget is a form that's associated with the Middle Woodland period and the Hopewell culture. And this comes from the Fort Mounds and Village. So this is a direct link to the Hopewell culture, which has not really been associated so much with the Fort Village. Here we've got what they call a copper tinker. So they think that was attached to clothes and like maybe banged together to make noise. And then at the bottom it, and on the right is a beaded bracelet, which is also consistent with Hopewell culture goods. Then we've got some more little copper pieces. These are different forms of copper tinkers. They're folded over on the ends. So they think that's done for attachment. And on the left are little pieces of copper bracelets. So once again, sourced from around Lake Superior and then also the Southern Appalachian Mountains. 
Uh, so this piece of pottery is probably local woodland period pottery. It's grit tempered. It was pictured in Mill's book. It was not in the Charles Words catalogs, but I was able to identify it from the photograph. The piece on the right is probably also woodland period. It's tempered with rock. Uh, so that's probably an older piece of pottery. But then here again, on the left are two bowls, which are cons consistent with Mogollon culture brownware. So this is pottery that was created in New Mexico and probably traveled or traded to obtain. And then we also have a necklace here of marine shell. And so this is another example of just how far people would go to source their materials. And it's that much more valuable and that much more of a status symbol if you have to travel to the Gulf of Mexico to get it. Uh, so in the last two years, I was able to add sites associated with the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex to the Ohio Archeo Archaeological Inventory because of the information that we obtained from the Charles Wirtz catalog. What time is it? Okay. Uh, so one of these is Pixley's Grove Earthworks, which is located in Wheelersburg, Ohio. So here we've got Portsmouth. And then if we look to the east, we've got Pixley's Grove. And if we're on the map here, we've got Portsmouth Group C. And then if we go a little bit southeast, we've got the Pixley's Grove Earthworks, which were supposed to be mounds inside of circular enclosures. And here from the Pixley's Grove Earthworks, we've got a cache of 94 Indiana hornstone, some minimally worked, some worked all the way into uh, projectile points or knives. And then we've got another one of those bowls that is kind of characteristic of southern pottery, and then it is filled with what we think are arrowheads. Uh, so archaeologists would argue that this is late prehistoric period, the vessel is shell-tempered, the cache is consistent with points from the late prehistoric period. Oh, yes, yes, let's go back. So the bowl, there are 998 points found in a cache within this bowl, and it was found like this. Now we have a neighbor down the road who is a farmer and he said when he was a boy he was on his, the tractor plowing and he said that he unearthed something a lot like this, a bowl filled with points, but he said his dad would have gotten real mad at him so he just stayed on the tractor. Who knows what happened to it? <laughs> yeah. Now the a lot of archaeologists say that you should just leave it there. But I think that like when you're talking about a field or some place where it's on the surface and it's going to get destroyed, it's probably better off some in somebody's collection where it will be preserved. So if we look north from the Tremper Earthworks and the Fort Mounds and Village, we have the Schistler Mounds and Village, which in the past has been recognized as a late prehistoric period for ancient culture site. Um, but we have some really exotic material coming from the Schistler Mounds and Village. So here's a stone sphere. Uh, some people have argued that these were maybe used as cooking balls. Uh, this one we don't think was used maybe as a playing ball, but it was sourced out of state. So basalt is something that could have come down from Canada. It's pigmented with malachite, which once again would have come from the Carolinas or Michigan. It's about that big. Do you have one like that? I know. I just got it. I have no idea. Oh, that's so cool. About the same size. Yeah. Cool. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Yes, could be prehistoric. You're welcome. Uh, and then we have an effigy made out of catlinite. So um, catlinite is most famously sourced in Minnesota. And this would not have been useful as an axe because it was too soft of a material. There on the right, you can see another similar axe from Adams County made out of slate. And we also have fossilized shark teeth that were found at the Schistler village. There have never been sharks of this species in Ohio. So somebody had to travel somewhere near the ocean to be able to obtain these. But they were fossilized even during prehistoric times. Uh, at the top right there is a juvenile megalodon tooth. No. I would assume so. 
Yeah, I'd say it probably would have been a pretty important commodity. But then you also have to think, like, I don't think it would take all that long to walk somewhere. Or if you're going down the river, you'd get there pretty fast, but then it might take you a little longer to walk back. So I don't know if people traded or they traveled or they did a little bit of both, probably. Uh, and then to the west of the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex, um, in Earl Thomas Conley Riverside Park was found this beautiful butterfly banner stone. This material was probably sourced at Flint Ridge. So if we're looking here, this is Portsmouth Group A, and right across the river from Portsmouth Group A is where this banner stone was found. So the Scioto County Infirmary Mound is a really special mound in the Portsmouth Earthworks Complex because this one dates to the Archaic period. So this is one of the earliest mounds, uh, and it's kind of a, a low mound, has a low grade to it, but it's probably about 500 feet, close to 500 feet long, uh, maybe three or 400 feet wide. It's a big, big area. And from the Scioto County Infirmary Mound is a stone bowl made of basalt. This is also thought to date to the Archaic period. People think that once pottery was developed, then people stopped making stone bowls because they're so hard to make. But I could argue that maybe there's a reason to make a stone bowl because it could serve a different purpose as far as grinding things up than a pottery bowl that would be easier to break. So who knows? Now, I will say that there was a stone bowl that was discovered in, at the Hopewell Earthwork 33RO27 in Chillicothe, Ohio, which is the type site for the Hopewell culture. So it is arguable that it could have come from the Middle Woodland period. So these are the sites that I was able to add to the registry. So there are seven of them. And I know I'm running out of time. The Arlington edition was on the west side of Portsmouth near the Scioto River. And from the Arlington edition are two quartz sandstone discoidals. These are another material that you would find in the Carolinas. It's not native to Scioto County. Um, these objects are sometimes thought to date to the late prehistoric period, but there have also been comparable objects found in the mounds. And here we have a bottle, late prehistoric period, uh, similar style to bottles that you would find in Arkansas and Texas with the red slip covering. Uh, the Knoll Mound was kind of north of the Horseshoe Mounds in Portsmouth. And from the Knoll Mound, we have another piece of Mogollon culture pottery, it's probably originated in New Mexico. The Bannon Mound was on the west side of Portsmouth. We've got another Mogollon culture bowl here. Uh, the Dameron found was, Farm was on the south side of Portsmouth. And from the Dameron Farm, we have celts. All of these celts are made out of material not native to Scioto County. Could have been carried here by the glaciers. Uh, we also have a flint celt. This jewel flint is probably originated at Flint Ridge in eastern Ohio. Uh, there was a mound on Raven Rock, so there's a very famous lookout, which you can actually get a permit from uh, Shawnee State Park to hike up to the Raven Rock lookout point in Scioto County. And this is a comp compiled image of what it looks like now with an early photograph from the 1900s. And behind this was a mound made out of stone and earth. And this is a cache of what they call leaf-shaped blades or Adena blades, uh, which were found in the Raven Rock mound. So this one's really interesting. So the steel plant mound is, was in New Boston, Ohio. The steel plant mound <laughs> is crazy because associated with Portsmouth Group A, the old Fort Earthwork in Kentucky, were what they call the mounds on the Brown Farm. One of these mounds on the Brown Farm had a sandstone wall circle inside of it. Inside of this sandstone walled circle were 22 bodies missing their heads. So 15 years later, in New Boston, in the steel plant mound, they found 22 skulls. So we're looking at a distance of over four and a half miles across the Ohio River. Yes? No. Now, we don't know what happened to any of them. So this is all reported in the 1930s. So like, who knows what happened to the bodies? Nobody knows. And. Uh, we assume Hopewell because it was associated with the Hopewell Earthworks, but nobody really knows. It's very irregular to have a sandstone block wall inside one of the mounds. I Who knows? I don't know. It could have been, but yeah, I mean, who knows? But something happened where they didn't want those... 
<laughs> those people were either did something bad enough that they were going to have their heads displaced from their bodies over four and a half miles, or like maybe they were worried about them coming back to haunt them after they were dead and needed to like separate them from their bodies. Who knows what happened there? But it's one of the more interesting stories related to the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. And the only artifact we have in the collection from the steel plant mound is this double bitted hematite grooved axe. So this is a local material, um, but the groove in it, it makes archeologists think that it probably dates to a time before most of the mounds were built. And then in Wheelersburg, in the Charles Worth wrote the manuscript, he wrote a manuscript about the earthworks in the 1930s. And in his manuscript, he mentions a mound in the Memorial Burial Park in Wheelersburg in the forest. And uh, no one's ever mentioned it, heard on it, it's not documented anywhere. I went and got permission from the cemetery owners last year to go look for it, and lo and behold, there it was. So I don't know for sure whether it's a prehistoric mound or whether it's something historic. The caretakers of the cemetery had worked there for the last 60 years. They did not remember anyone ever disturbing it or creating it, so it's possible that it is a prehistoric mound. It's on the state registry now as a potential prehistoric mound. Uh, it's probably about 15 feet high and maybe 30 or 40 feet long. It's kind of elliptical in shape, but uh, that elliptical shape is something we do see occasionally. There's an elliptical mound at Mount City. There's elliptical mounds at the Sipe Earthworks in Chillicothe. And we do not have any artifacts from the Memorial Burial Park Mound, but you can see that it's way over in this corner near the Pixley's Grove Earthworks. So if we're looking at Memorial Burial Park, all the way over here to the Turkey Creek Earthworks is about 11 miles. It's about 11 miles all the way up to the Schistler Mounds and Village. Uh, so just the recognized portions of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex is spanning seven miles from the edge of here to the Old Fort Earthwork. And it's about eight miles if you follow the parallel embankments all the way down back and forth. So it's a pretty impressive place. I encourage all of you, if you're interested in this, come and check out the collection at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, we also do free group tours by appointment. So you can call me up and we can schedule a tour and have a grand time. And uh, we have a ton of people that come through and they see Serpent Mound and we're so close, 30 miles away, that they come and see the collection. Same thing, come and see the collection, come and see the Serpent Mound. So I want to give a big thank you to Vernon Teach, who is our adjunct curator of the Somac Works collection, who has helped me a ton in my research. I have to thank Lacey Davis for photographs. I have to thank Dr. Shoemaker for helping me identify materials. And I also want to thank Jeb Bowen, who is a professional archaeologist that also helped me identify some of our lithic materials. And then also to Jeffrey Wilson, who has assisted me a lot in my research. So thank you all so much. <laughs>